What's up, my comic comrades? The next installment of Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is about to hit theaters, and it looks like it's going to be full of nostalgia and fan service, including the glorious return of Slimer. So while we wait for the movie's release, let's talk about some of the most interesting Easter eggs and shocking facts about the Ghostbusters franchise. First on that list is the fact that Ghostbusters almost wasn't the name of the film. You see, at the time, the name Ghostbusters was already taken by Filmation's 1975 Ghostbusters live-action kids series that had no relation to the Ghostbusters movie. Because of this, other names were almost used, like Ghost Stoppers, Ghost Blasters, Ghost Breakers, and the front runner, Ghost Smashers. In fact, Ghost Smashers was the name on the first script, but more on that in a second. Ultimately, as we know, given the name of the first film and the entire franchise, Columbia Pictures was able to get the rights to the name Ghostbusters by striking a deal with Filmation, aka paying them. However, when 1986 rolled around, both the original Filmation live-action kid show and the Ghostbusters movie wanted to make an animated series based on their live-action counterparts. Filmation went ahead and called their 1986 animated series simply Ghostbusters, now known as Filmation's Ghostbusters, while Columbia Pictures Ghostbusters named their cartoon The Real Ghostbusters. As a nice little jab saying, you may have had the name first, but we're the real Ghostbusters. And let's be honest, The Real Ghostbusters was one of the best cartoons to come out of the 80s, up there with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, at least for me. Now, remember how I said the first draft or script for Ghostbusters was titled Ghost Smashers? Well, the first script, aka the Ghost Smashers script, was a completely different movie than the one we ended up getting. You see, the original Ghostbusters script that Dan Aykroyd wrote was a film meant for him and his good buddy, John Belushi. Dan Aykroyd has always taken an interest to the paranormal and parapsychology, and we'll get into that a bit more later. But his interest in the paranormal combined with the love for classic ghost comedies like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man led to him writing a draft for Ghost Smashers in 1981. However, in 1982, while he was still working on the script, Belushi passed away. Belushi was intended to play fan favorite Ghostbuster Peter Venkman, a role that would be made iconic by Bill Murray, so that's a fun fact in itself. But don't worry, Belushi would still end up in the film in a spiritual sense, which we'll also explain in a bit. Anyway, the original script took place in the year 2012. Yes, the story was originally supposed to take place in the future, but it's probably a good thing they changed that because the first two Ghostbusters films were made while visual effects were still in their awkward teenage phase, so they probably wouldn't have aged as well. Although, Marty McFly travels to the year 2015 and back to the future, and that movie and franchise holds up like a champ, so who knows. But another massive difference between Ackroyd's original script and the one we actually got is that the Ghost Smash business would have already been an established organization with a bunch of competing Ghost Smasher teams. But if that isn't different enough, in the first draft, these Ghost Hunters or Ghost Smashers travel through time and space and even other dimensions to fight and trap ghosts. The overall tone of the movie would have been a lot darker than what we ended up getting. Even Slimer, the fan favorite ghost of the franchise, wouldn't have been cute and was under the name Onion Head. Another thing that would have been massively different besides there being different Ghostbuster teams is the fact that some of those teams would have been evil or nefarious. All in all, Ghost Smashers, the first draft for Ghostbusters, would have been drastically different than what we ended up getting. But that begs the question, how did we end up getting the Ghostbusters we all know and love today? Well, as you could imagine, the original Ghost Smashers script would have demanded a much bigger budget as there was going to be a bunch of different Ghost Smashers or Buster teams. It was also going to deal with time, space, and other dimensions. Just the sheer scope of it would have cost the studio way more than they wanted to spend. So needless to say, Columbia Pictures, specifically their chairman at the time, Frank Pierce, was like, this this script is going to have to be reworked to cost a lot less. So to help with this, Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman and Aykroyd brought in Harold Ramis, who had worked with Ivan Reitman in the past on movies like Stripes and Animal House. Now with Trinity, so to speak, Reitman, Aykroyd, and Ramis would head to Martha's Vineyard for an intense writer's summit, where the three of them would rework the script into something completely different, making it more grounded while still keeping all the original sensibilities and elements Aykroyd wanted for the movie. Eventually, it morphed into the 1984 Ghostbusters film we know and love today, and Harold Ramis, who would also play Egon Spengler, was a massive part of that. But before we keep slinging those Ghostbuster facts and Easter eggs, I've always wondered what my full ancestry looked like. So a little while ago, I lent some of my DNA to today's sponsor, MyHeritage, to see where I really come from. Well, I just got my results, and we're gonna open them together. I'm actually pretty freaking excited about this. If you're wondering how this is possible, MyHeritage is a leading global family history and DNA service that makes exploring your roots incredibly simple. In fact, they send you a kit with step-by-step -step instructions 
to collect the samples they need to analyze your DNA. You just swab both cheeks for 30 seconds, insert the swabs into the vials, place them in the plastic bag, insert it into the enclosed envelope, slap a stamp on it, and ship it off to their lab. And I recommend you adding a tracking option when you send for peace of mind. Anyway, the whole thing takes two minutes and then you'll get your results in three to four weeks. But it's been a few weeks since I sent off my DNA kit and I just got my results. So let's see what soup your boy's made up. All right, so my My Heritage results are in. And what I've been told my whole life from my parents and my family is I'm basically like 100% Puerto Rican, Hispanic. Let's see what I actually am. 30% Iberian it's from uh, Spain. 23.1% Mesoamerican. 16.7% Italian? Bro, I'm Italian. 9.9% Nigerian. That That's pretty cool. All right, so it breaks down the other 20 or so percent. So Nigerian, like I just said, is 9.9%. North African, 8.5%. Kenyan, 3.9%. And West African, 2.9%. Ultimately, I am still Puerto Rican, but it's really interesting to see how all my different ancestors made what I am now. And I wouldn't suspect it, that they all came from these different places of the world. So this is really cool to know. So there you have it. Like most of us, I'm essentially a hybrid. But this was stupid fun and really interesting to learn how broad my roots actually are. I highly recommend you do this for yourself. Just click the link in the description to order your DNA kit today. And if you use our coupon code, variant DNA, you'll get free shipping. And as a bonus, you can start a 30-day free trial of MyHeritage's best subscription for family history research. Lastly, a huge thank you to MyHeritage for making this possible. Now, remember earlier when I said John Belushi would still end up being in the film in a spiritual sense? Well, Dan Aykroyd would confirm that Slimer was heavily inspired by his good friend John Belushi. Now, if you've seen National Lampoon's Animal House from 1978, you remember Belushi's iconic cafeteria scene where he's just going down the cafeteria line, piling all the food he can on his tray, simultaneously stuffing his face. Well, Slimer's love for food and stuffing it down his face came from that iconic Belushi scene. But Slimer isn't the only way Belushi still made it into the Ghostbusters franchise in a roundabout way. Nope, he would actually make a cameo as his character Joliet from the Blues Brothers in issue one of IDW's Ghostbusters comic. In the comic, Ray Dan Aykroyd's character is dreaming of how things went down with the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man at the end of the first Ghostbusters film. Except the way he's dreaming about it isn't how things went down originally. And in said dream, he's greeted by a spirit or a ghost. One that looks exactly like John Belushi as he appeared in the Blues Brothers. The spirit that is clearly supposed to be John Belushi confronts Ray saying, hey, doesn't matter how you got there, Gozer is gone, but also there's a bigger threat coming. I think this is really cool that since Dan Aykroyd originally intended for John Belushi to play Peter Venkman, there are still things in the Ghostbusters franchise that honor him since the role was originally intended for him. But going back to Slimer, he's easily one of the most recognizable characters in the franchise. I would even say pop culture in general, but the funny thing about it is that Slimer is never referred to as Slimer in either of the two Ghostbusters films. He wasn't given the name Slimer until the real Ghostbusters animated series. In the series, he's basically part of the team, being their pet, so to speak. With him being such a massive part of the real Ghostbusters animated series, it led to him returning briefly in Ghostbusters 2 as a bus driver giving Rick Moranis' character, Louis Tully, a ride. Yet another crazy secret or fact about the franchise is that the character Winston Zedmore was originally offered to Eddie Murphy, but he turned it down with the role later going to Ernie Hudson. Now the crazy thing is, Winston would go on to be one of the most loved characters from the franchise, but he didn't have that much screen time in the first Ghostbusters film, and despite having a much bigger role in the sequel, he still didn't get as much screen time as his co-stars. Now one of the coolest things about Ghostbusters is that it was inspired by real-life paranormal investigators. But the kicker is they weren't just random paranormal investigators. No, they were based on ones directly related to Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is really into the paranormal, and that is mainly because it runs in his family. You see, his great-grandfather, Sam Aykroyd, was a massive believer in the supernatural. He was a psychic investigator who would conduct full-on seances in Aykroyd's family home. This would in turn be passed down to his grandfather, Maurice Aykroyd. Maurice worked at the Bell Telephone Company, and it's been said that he used his knowledge of telephones and radio waves to make a high vibration crystal radio to be able to contact the spiritual realm. On top of that, Dan Aykroyd's father, Peter Aykroyd, wrote a book that was published in 2009 titled A History of Ghosts. So paranormal research and activity has been passed down from generation to generation in the Aykroyd family. So naturally, Dan Aykroyd was and still is extremely 
interested in UFOs and all sorts of psychic supernatural research. It's the reason he went on to co-create Ghostbusters right after he left Saturday Night Live in 1979. There's even a nice little nod or Easter egg to this in Ghostbusters Afterlife, where Aykroyd's character Ray is revealed to be the only subscriber to the character podcast's podcast, Mythical Tales of the Unknown Universe. Another crazy thing about Ghostbusters is Sigourney Weaver's audition for Dana Barrett. You see, she was coming off her iconic performance as Ripley in the first Alien film. Even though that was a massive success, she wanted to do a comedy after doing something so serious. So during her audition for Ivan Reitman, she apparently acted like a possessed dog walking on her hands and knees, growling and portraying how she would perform when she was possessed by Zool. Needless to say, Ivan Reitman was reportedly a little freaked out about it, but not enough to not give her the role as she would indeed get the job. Here's another cool thing. Once the Ghostbusters defeat Gozer at the climax of the first film, Ray tells the formerly possessed Lewis Tully, you know, Mr. Tully, you are a most fortunate individual. You have been a participant in the biggest interdimensional cross rip since the Tunguska blast of 1909. Well, that wasn't made up. That's a real explosion that happened in central Russia in 1908. But instead of being the result of getting rid of Gozer, it was likely a meteor impact. But that's not the end of real references in Ghostbusters. In fact, they actually use real paranormal references as well. One that's really crazy is that Gozer, the destructor, existed before Ghostbusters. Yeah, believe it or not, Gozer was a supernatural being that apparently made its presence known in 1970s London as part of the famous Enfield Poltergeist case. Allegedly, over an 18-month period, the Hodgson family was haunted and tormented by a poltergeist. This story gained traction all over the world with several journalists, paranormal researchers, and psychics visiting the household. But this is where it gets even crazier. It was reported that during a seance at their house, a medium named Annie Shaw suddenly screamed, go away! Her husband, who attended with her, tried to tell the spirit to go away and leave her alone as Annie started to moan, Gozer, Gozer, help me. Her husband would go on to say, this Gozer is a nasty piece of work, a sort of black magic chap. Like I just said, this was a world famous case in the 70s, and as we know, the late 70s and early 80s is when Dan Aykroyd was working on the Ghostbusters script. So we definitely heard about this case, especially being so into the supernatural, and decided to take the name Gozer for the main antagonist for the film. Another thing that was taken from real paranormal research is the Temple of Gozer. Not specifically Gozer's temple, but a gateway from our world to the paranormal. You see, in the paranormal world, these gateways are known as vortexes or just portals. And as you would assume, they are believed to be points where the spiritual meets the physical that allows supernatural entities to come into our world. So this is another idea that Ghostbusters took from real paranormal research and beliefs. I could keep going on and on with things Ghostbusters took from real paranormal research, but I want to shift gears to focus on Ghostbusters Afterlife since we're getting its sequel, Frozen Empire, really soon. So let's talk about some Easter eggs in that film. Now, one of my personal favorite Easter eggs from the film is the Nestle's Crunch Bar, mainly because Nestle's Crunch Bars was one of my favorite candy bars growing up. Hell, I still love them, more specifically, Bunch of Crunch, which is the same thing. It's just like little bite-sized pieces. Pop it right in your mouth. Delish. In any case, in Ghostbusters Afterlife, Phoebe finds her grandfather Egon's Ghostbusters jumpsuit hidden in the basement, and when she looks in one of its pockets, she finds a Nestle's Crunch Bar. Well, if you remember, in the original 84 Ghostbusters, right after the team gets kicked out of the university it was working at, Venkman turns to Egon and says, you've earned this, as he hands him a Nestle's Crunch Bar. This is never really explained, but since Venkman hands Egon a Crunch Bar and Phoebe found one decades later in Egon's jumpsuit, it may just be Egon's favorite candy bar, so it's a nice little callback. And sticking with Egon, we also see his collection of spores, molds, and fungus. This is a significant Easter egg because in the original Ghostbusters film, when Janine asks Egon if he has any hobbies, he looks at her saying, I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Another great one is Ray's Occult Books, returning for Ghostbusters Afterlife. This was first introduced in 1989's Ghostbusters 2. You see, in Ghostbusters 2, after New York loses interest in the Ghostbusters and no longer needs their services, even though they just saved the world from Gozer not too long ago, Ray opens up his occult bookstore to pay the bills, playing off Dan Aykroyd's real-world interest in the occult. So it was really cool for it to make a return in Afterlife. Here's another fun easter egg. If you weren't aware, Josh Gad is a massive Ghostbusters fan. So much so, they decided to give him a small part in the film. He is the person responsible for the grunts of the ghost muncher. Then we have one of my favorites in the post credit scenes of Afterlife, where Dana Barrett is performing the psychic card test on Peter Venkman as a callback to the original psychic card scene at the beginning of the 1984 Ghostbusters. It just provided so much fan service, it was remarkable. I can't believe you used to shock your students. Between us, I only zap the guys. 
Another fun one from Afterlife is Louis Tully slash a Rick Moranis callback. Unfortunately, he doesn't appear or make an actual cameo in the film, but we briefly see the colander helmet he wears in the 84 film on top of Egon's desk. Podcast even puts it on during the end of the film, and it's pretty great. While there are more Easter eggs, like the return of Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in mini forms, we're gonna end on one of the best Easter eggs of the entire film, at least in our opinion. And that is when Ray is asked once again by Gozer if he's a god. He pauses this time and remembers to say yes. This is a callback to the original Ghost Ghostbusters film when Gozer asks if he's a god and he says no, at which point Gozer blasts him and all the Ghostbusters back on their butts. Winston then says, Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. And this time, he did indeed say yes. But there you have it, several Ghostbuster facts and Easter eggs you probably didn't know about. Are you guys excited for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? For us, Ghostbusters Afterlife was great. A proper sequel for the beloved Ghostbusters franchise done by Ivan Reitman's son, Jason Reitman, which in itself is a great tribute to the original films. In any case, let us know your thoughts on the facts and Easter eggs we covered here or any others you know of down in the comments. Other than that, we'll see you next time when we talk about all things comics.